Yeah. Sure. You know, when we are incorporating these nanoplatelets into polymeric matrix, there are certain parameter of these nanoplatelets. One is the dimension, right? And as I said, any materials are three dimensional and then two dimensions are in a nanometer range like one nanometers, extremely small. The other length dimension could be 200, 400 is, is showing like here from, it could vary from 100 to 1000, right? So that's the length and that's we are referring as the aspect ratio. So length divided by width and width is one. So whatever length is that's the one actually we are referring. So this is one parameter. Other parameter is the percentage of nanoplatelets. Percentage means that if your polymeric matrix has a certain amount of weight or volume, then how much it is compared to nanoparticle or how much is a nanoparticle in terms of the percentage weight or volume compared to the polymer. So that is the percentage loading and like for example, it says here 1 percent, 1 percent, right? The third factor is let's say intercalation or aggregation. One means you will have just one platelet. Two means two are coming and sitting together. When they come and sit together, they are not really, it is reducing the volume of the platelet because more are coming and sitting together, but it is not helping to improve the barrier property because one is sitting behind another one, right? So it is not able to improve the barrier property because the first one is able to block the oxygen diffusion and second one is not helping. So that is what we are to see the effect of that width. So one means it's a one platelet and five means the five platelets. So as you can see here, if you have only one, for the first one, if you can see that with 200, you are able to reduce from one to around little less than 0.2. But for the same 200, you see you are able to reduce only up to 0.5, right? So lower the intercalation, better reduction in barrier property or improvement in the barrier property, sorry, reduction in diffusivity or permeability, okay? And so this is 1% loading and this is a 7% loading. So if you have 1%, it's not very effective, 2%, uh, this is I think 3 and this is 5. So you can say 1 to 3 significant improvement, 3 to 5 also some improvement, but 5 to 7 is also a little bit improvement. So one can see that, you know, where to cut off. Right, for example, 5% gives you here and 7% gives you here. So if you want this level of improvement, then you incorporate 7%. And here to here, the difference is like one and five. So yeah, so that's what it is really. So how the nanoplatelet parameters are affecting the gas diffusion or barrier property of the film, that's what is shown in all different figures. Sir? Yes. Okay, so, so the way it happens, you know how films are made? Films are made using um, extrusion process. I am sure you must have studied the food extrusion, but actually the food extrusion, the extrusion concept is borrowed from actually polymer industry. They have this extruder long, long before we started using in a food industry. So there you have the barrel, you have the screw, you have the hopper, you put your polymer in one end. Of course, in case of a food, you also add water with your wheat flour or whatever you know, powder material you have. But in case of polymer, you don't add any water. But you could have some plasticizer or some colorant, whatever. And then in that you know, barrel where you have the screw conveyor, um, you, you increase the pressure and temperature. So you, they have the heating elements. And then it, as it is flowing, it will have a melt. Right? It will increase the temperature, come very close to the melting point of the polymer and you convey and, and the, another end you have a die and die could be slit die if you want to make a film. So from that the film will come out. So what you do, when, when you put, the, put your polymer in one hopper, when they start melting, then at certain distance you have another hopper through which you drop your nanoparticles. So there these nanoparticles would mix very well within the melt. So that's the assumption, although they really do not mix very well. And that's why you get this kind of um, 
arrangement rather than this kind. If you're able to distribute very well, and what happens uh, as melt is flowing, right? We are assuming that these nanoparticles will follow because of the shear forces, they will follow the same flow pattern and try to align themselves with the flow. So we are hoping that they, they would form this kind of structure. And then when it comes out, these nanoparticles are embedded in your polymeric structure, which means in that thickness. So this is how they incorporate the nanoparticles. Global means? Global means uh, instead of having plates, uh, horizontal plates, uh, which uh, get, uh, we can have uh, spheres. Oh, if you have a sphere, mm. then the problem would be, can you think of, um, maybe I, I, I'll make the switch on to this one. Imagine if you have a sphere like this and compare to platelet. So in case of a sphere, you see, you will not, even though you increase the concentration, because when gases start diffusing, you will have this smaller area to block. And then it will easily go from here, even though this sphere was probably here, there's a very small area to block and then it will go here. Compared to this one, if you see here, they had to really travel like this. So platelet, and as you can see from the from the graph, then you have higher the, the aspect ratio. The, if the length is higher, better it is, because then gas has to follow that along that length and that distance will increase. If the length is small, then it doesn't help much. Somewhere, yeah, you see this aspect ratio, if it's 200 compared to 1000, especially if you look at this line, you see if you had 200, this level of reduction you have, if you have 1000 you have more reduction in the diffusivity. So in case of a sphere, you would have very little area to really block. Yeah. So that means we cannot uh, control the alignment of nanoplay inside the packaging material. Um, true. Um, whatever analysis I'm showing here, it is from the computer simulation. When you really do that, um, you, it, it is a bit hard. Um, people have been trying to change the surface chemistry of this so that they have repulsive forces and they don't aggregate, right? So that's a one sort of a area of research. People have been trying to modify the surface chemistry to see whether they can allow it to have a repulsion so they do not aggregate. And another challenge is the inclination like this. So if you have really long barrel, then you know you it will allow um, um, nano platelet to flow uh, align themselves in the direction of flow rather than having vertical vertical is more unstable horizontal is more stable so naturally it should but then you have to allow enough time residence time in, in extruder so that they find time to align themselves but then it's going to increase the production cost because Otherwise, your film was ready to be extruded. Your, your material was heated enough, mixed enough, but now you have to provide extra length, which means extra time, which means less throughput from the system. So then cost becomes the, the, the issue for that. So, but scientists have been trying many different ways to, to work on it, but so far we do not have commercially available nanocomposite films with very, very high barrier property because of these challenges. Okay, we go, move ahead, okay. Okay, so entering design of modify atmosphere packaging. So when you want to select, so the previous one we were looking at that we want to improve barrier property as much as possible. Um, it could be sterilized for the sterilized product or it could be product where you have a lot of fat so that you want to minimize the fat oxidation, you want extremely high gas barrier, oxygen barrier films. But in case of um, fresh produce, um, we don't want really extremely high barrier. What we want is appropriate barrier so that we can, we can extend the shelf life. 
So, um, ha have you done any post harvest technology class? Yes? So, as you would know that many uh, fresh fruits and vegetable, as you all know, they're aspiring commodity, they're living commodity. So, they produce carbon dioxide and then they, they consume oxygen, right? So, with research, these, these post-harvest horticulture people have learned that, that if you slow down this respiration, then you can increase the shelf life. So to slow down refrigeration, one thing which we know very well and we probably do that is you reduce the temperature. This is very simple and common that you put your vegetables and fruit in refrigerator, right? Of course, not all, not all fruit would like four degrees centigrade. Now, can you give me an example? Banana. Banana or even mango, some other tropical fruit, they are probably 12, 13 degrees more optimal than four degrees C. Nevertheless, in general, lower the temperature, you lower the respiration. Other than that, they also learn that if you want to reduce the respiration, you can modify the atmosphere around that product. Atmosphere means the gas composition. Um, so reduce the oxygen from 21% to somewhere around five, six, eight percent, depending upon the product and then you increase the CO2 concentration and CO2 would be about 10 to 15 percent uh, again depending upon the product and if you're able to maintain that then then you would have considerably lower um, respiration and then it was going to prolong the shelf life so that's the principle behind modified atmosphere packaging so the temperature and the gas composition so now, if you have a bulk storage, um, what means that like a room full of like this, you know, you have cabbage or cauliflower or mango, then if you, if you want to control the atmosphere, what we call CA, controlled atmosphere, right? There you can use the mechanical systems to really control the environment. How would you use mechanical systems? Correct, so you can pull, pull the air from inside and scrub the oxygen, you know, react with something, reduce the level of oxygen concentration, put it back. And of course, uh, initially you don't have to do much with CO2 because it's gonna keep on building. Then after some time it comes to a certain level, which is desirable for a given uh, fruit or vegetable. Then of course after that you can also remove in a similar manner CO2. So this is how we do it. But how do we do it? We have a small package, right? Which are at the consumer level or at a grocery store. So there you cannot have these kind of mechanical systems. So there what we are looking at to select the, the permeability of the film with respect to oxygen, water vapor, as well as CO2. Why water vapor? Because you try to maintain relatively high relative humidity. Not very, very high, because if you have very, very high relative humidity, close to 100%, which you could have, if there is some temperature fluctuation, what will happen? You will have condensation and it, it may encourage the microbial growth. So probably you want 85, 90, not very low, because then you will have transpiration losses. So you, you select a film. So how do, we, how do we select that film? And that's what is actually this engineering design of MEP. So for a given food product, a given fresh vegetable or fruit, you should know what is the optimal gas composition you want to have, right? So let's say 12% of CO2 and 7.5% of O2, right? What relative humidity you want? You set 85, 90%. All these research have been done, what is the optimal relative humidity for different food product and gas composition as well. And once you know those conditions, then based on that, if you know the quantity of your material in that package, then it can tell you how much gas is going to produce and how much gas is going to consume. So it's going to produce CO2 and it's going to consume O2.
So you would know based on that information. Now if you had to maintain that amount of composition inside, then you can do the calculation. For example, a given fruit would like to have optimal composition of CO2 is 12%. So you want to maintain inside 12%. And what is the composition outside the package of CO2? Nearly zero. Mathematically, you know, there is some number, but practical purpose is zero, right? So now, imagine you have a product inside the bag, you know the mass, and at 12% CO2 composition inside, what would be the CO2 generation for that particular mass? You can find out because that's, that's the research has been done. That given mango, let's say, how much CO2 is going to produce if the atmosphere around mango is 12% CO2. If it was 0% CO2, it's going to produce large amount of CO2. But if it's already 12%, it's going to produce less. But whatever it's going to produce, that is going to change the partial pressure of CO2 inside. So you want to have the permeability of film in a manner such that whatever it is producing, it should go out, right? And how you can do that? Now you know that how much it should go out. So you know the Q, you know the surface area of the film, you know the thickness of the film, right? You know the delta P. What you don't know is permeability. So from that equation you can find what would be the permeability, CO2 permeability of that film. In the same manner, you want to do calculation for relative humidity as well as um, or water vapor transmission rate and O2. And once you do that, then you will know that you want a film with this level of CO2 permeability, this level of O2 permeability, and water vapor transmission rate or water vapor permeability. Okay, so this is how, so that's what is, is here. This can give you the, the um, value of, you know, gas permeability for that film. Of course, it is possible that you may not find any film which has exactly the same value of permeability with respect to O2, CO2, and water vapor. So either you work with a polymer company to design those films, or whatever films are available um, based on their values, you try to select which is as close as possible to what is desired for your product. Make sense? Yeah, it is not very complicated math, um, but a little bit math would be required to solve equations such as this one, plus the other one where you have Q is equal to permeability multiplied by, uh, you know, area delta P and divided by L, so that formula. Okay, so these all information is required for you, respiration rate with respect to oxygen, CO2 for a given produce, under that atmospheric condition, uh, transpiration rate, which is the moisture loss, this is important for the water vapor permeability point of view. You should know product mass and volume. Um, for package, you should know, you know, uh, head space, because that's where the gas composition would be, right? So you should have enough volume inside so that it can occupy by, by your fruit, as well as some head space where it will hold the gases and of course this is the one which you want to really calculate and this is the optimal condition which you would find from literature uh, that for a given fruit what is the optimal condition in terms of O2, CO2 or temperature and RH, okay? Now another important topic uh, for packaging is migration and food and package interaction. What kind of a migration we are talking here? Now we are not talking about transmission of gases, right? We are talking about the migration of component which are present in the package, our polymer, polymeric films specifically. Other than the polymer themselves, what else there in that polymeric structure? Additives, so these additives are usually added to improve manufacturability of this plastic film. 
Uh, sometimes they add plasticizer so that you can stretch them very well. Sometimes they add uh, UV blocking agent. Uh, Sometimes they add uh, flame retardant. So polymer can easily get fired, right? Catch fire. So you can add some, you know, chemicals that it will not easily catch the fire. Sometimes we add because polymer when you melt, especially high molecular weight polymers, they are very very viscous. So if you want to process them. If higher the viscosity, you will need higher mechanical power to work with them. So they add some chemical to reduce its viscosity, or reduce its melting point, so then we invest less energy when we are doing the manufacturing. So surprisingly, this chemical industry adds hundreds of different additives. And these are mostly low molecular weight additives. And they tend to migrate from polymeric structure into food. And sometimes when we do polymerization, so initially we have the monomer like ethylene. From that ethylene we make polyethylene. So we do this polymerization process. Most of the chemical engineers work on that. So when we do this polymerization, some of the monomer are not joined together and make the polymer. They just stay as those monomers. Those are also low molecular weight material. So they also tend to migrate. And of course in most cases all these are carcinogenic or health you know, creating problems. Um, so um, we, we do not want to see this, this migration. Or based on the is, is bad health effect, um, the regulatory agency have come up with the sort of a guidelines that okay, under the condition of use, you should have this level of migration. It should not be more than that. So many PPM or PPB, whatever they have. In fact, whatever ch chemical compound we are incorporating, in this polymeric structure. This is known to scientists and regulatory agencies. And from toxicology studies, it has been, it has been established that what level of compound would are really problematic. So they have set the limits. So then uh, our objective now is that, okay, fine, even we should not incorporate first thing, but even if we had to incorporate because we want to improve the functionality or manufacturability of these uh, polymers, then under the condition of use, the migration should be within that limits. So that's the migration we are talking about. So that is migration from packaging film into food. Is there any other way migration also? Some of the flavors are actually absorbed, if they absorbed by the polymeric films, then it can affect the quality of the food product. But at the same time, it can also affect the property of the packaging material. It may change its mechanical strength, it may change its melting point, because it's not the polymer you started with. Now it has incorporated some food ingredient into it, right? So from its mechanical strength point of view, there's a possibility it may change. Our thermal stability may be different or its optical property may change. So that also is a problematic and that also under the condition of use, we want to minimize that. Okay, so this is the general information that it can protect, but it can interact. Interaction could be negative. Can interaction can be positive? In case of active packaging. Okay, and then it could be physical, chemical, and biological in nature. And this is what it is, uh, movement of chemical compound packaged to food, or it could be other, other direction. Uh, it could be microscopic or macroscopic. Okay, the mechanism of migration is typically diffusion because these compounds are moving within a structure. So they go from higher concentration to the lower concentration. And it is important both from consumer protection point of view and regulatory compliance point of view. Most countries, um, they do have some sort of a regulation, even though it may differ from one country to another country, but in most country, they do have you know, um, good regulation. So the guiding principles are really similar. 
So scalping is the one we call, which is a reverse migration. It means like flavor going something from food into the package. Um, this happens usually flavor and you, you can lose the desirable flavor. And a lot of research has been gone into this, both you know, scalping as well as the migration. Actually around 1970s, the first time scientists learned um, and the first case was, if I recall correctly, it was with the cheese, you know, had the individually sliced cheese wrapped into the polymeric films, like a craft cheese, I don't know what kind of cheese we have here. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so it's an individual slice, it's wrapped, then on several slices together in the, in the bigger wrapping. So the first time they learned from there, and then last actually 40 plus years, industry, especially polymer industry, has done a lot of work to, to minimize this migration. Um, and they have eliminated hundreds of compounds which they used to incorporate, but it's still, you know, whenever they come up with the new polymeric structures, um, they need to have the FDA or regulatory approval to be used as a food contact surface. So we have a lot of experimental methods in place to monitor this migration. And in case of active packaging, we have intentional migration. So we say that this actually low molecular weight materials are the one which tends to migrate. Um, high molecular weight, you know, which is a polymer itself, actually usually doesn't migrate. And this migration depends upon the chemical nature. As I mentioned, residuals such as a monomers, which have not been converted into polymer, and some of the catalysts, uh, they also tend to migrate. And somehow, sometimes you have decomposable product, a uh, decomposition of, let's say, you know, uh, PET, such as uh, acetaldehyde and oligomers, uh, they can also migrate because they become a smaller molecular weight because they are break down from the big molecules such as PET. And this, this migration, you can classify into three different kind of a categories. In one case, you know, they do not migrate uh, or the migration is, is, you know, beyond the detectable limits because there's a limit we can, we can detect. In one case, which is, let me put this as a first, is a leaching where the food is in a really direct contact with the polymeric film and then you see the migration. In other case, it, migration happens in more volatile in nature. So it has the uh, very high vapor pressure. So then, for example, it happens in the case of antimicrobials, right? So if you are making antimicrobial film and this film is wrapped around cheese, right? Then the cheese in a direct contact with the film. So then, you know, uh, you could have a leaching of those antimicrobial from the film to the surface of the cheese. But imagine if you have a bag in which you are putting grapes. Now these grapes are not really touching and not all the grapes are really touching the film. And even if they are in a contact, there is a point contact. It is not the, like a big surface contact. In that case, you want a migration in terms of the volatile. So these antimicrobials should just have a high vapor pressure and they, they just form the volatile. And this volatile will come in the head space of your bag and then that's where they will have the action. So these are the three different categories. And again, the diffusion um, like uh, follows the fixed law, very similar to as gas is being diffused within the polymeric structure. So diffusivity and thickness then can influence the overall diffusion or migration. And then diffusivity of these compound could could depend upon the molecular weight and chemical affinity as we were studying for the diffusion of gases. And in addition to that, temperature and turbulence can also influence. Temperature means the temperature of the system, you know, food and package. And turbulence is that if the liquid inside the package is being agitated. So this is a very similar equation as we saw for the diffusion of gases. In this case, we are looking diffusion of the the, the compound coming from film. So this is the film thickness from here to here. And this is, we are looking at the length. And this is the 
liquid side or the food side, I should say that. And whatever concentration you have in this, the migration is happening from this surface into food side. So the concentration here, it would decrease. The concentration is higher here. Then that compound will migrate from this side to this side and eventually it will get absorbed into the food. Now, have you done drawing? Experiment? Yes, no? Yes. So in case of a drawing, um, your food has a high moisture, high water activity. And what kind of air you use for the drawing? Hot and dry air. Why do we use hot air? Why not cold air? Because drying is a mass transfer process. It's not a heat transfer. I mean, we do not really heat transfer. We really want a mass transfer, right? We want water to be removed from the food. Sir, hot air has less relative humidity. Correct. So you, 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 can, you cannot have, you, you cannot either you remove the water from the air in order to make it drier, or you increase the temperature so that at high temperature it has a high water holding capacity, but it has original water, so then it's a relative humidity comes down. So now let's say if the relative humidity of air is, let's say, 10%, and your food has a lot of water, so up to what limit? So if, if this drying continues for several, several hours, at what level you could dry your product? What would be the equilibrium condition? Sorry? Equilibrium condition is the, the most uh, relative humidity at which the food is. So that's, you bring it from the uh, water activity, right? So, so eventually, the water activity of food will be same as relative humidity of air. So it, that will reach equilibrium condition. But in case of the migration of um, this compound from film to the food actually does not reach to the condition where you have same concentration in the food as well as in the film. Sometimes it is higher, actually most of the time, but it could be lower as well. So you, you, you could have the difference in the concentration of that compound which is migrating in film and in food. And that ratio is defined as a partitioning coefficient. Okay, so it, it does not behave the same as, as, as we see in case of a drying. That's also a diffusion process, like a mass diffusion, right? Moisture diffusion. So this chemical compound usually does not altogether migrate and has the same concentration in the film and in the food. It could have a higher concentration in the film compared to the food and that ratio we define as a partnership coefficient. So at the equilibrium, you would have this ratio and the CP could be higher than CF. So what are the limiting factors? So there are two things happening. One is a diffusion happening in the film and then there's a partitioning. So diffusion at some point will stop and it will not migrate from film into food. So if you really look the amount of migration would happen and how much you will have in a food, you can have four different scenarios. So if you look at this diagram, x-axis is time and y-axis is the concentration of that migrating substance into food. Okay, so imagine if the diffusion or diffusivity of that migrating compound is low and you have a high partitioning coefficient. High partitioning coefficient means what? You will have more concentration of this migrating compound in, in film, in polymer compared to food. If that, that, that's the partition coefficient is high, then the kind of curve, the migration you will see, you will see this migration. Migration is slow and the amount is also very low. And that is what actually really you want. So when you want to design a film for a given food product, you want it to follow 
this curve that the diffusivity of that migrating compound should be very low and the partition coefficient should be very high. In case the diffusivity is high and of course partition coefficient is also high then it will quickly diffuse because the diffusion is very high, diffusivity is high and then it will come to equilibrium. But in case if the partition coefficient is low, what does it mean? There's more and more compound is migrating into food. That's why this ratio is smaller. If ratio is smaller means more is coming into the food. And in case if the diffusivity of that compound is low, then it will take some time to migrate, but it would eventually migrate to the very high amount. And if the diffusivity is also high, then it will quickly migrate. So how this information would be useful? In terms of the designing or selecting the film. So for example, you have the migrating substance in the food. Let's say, assume that is unintentional. We really do not want it to migrate, right? But we know it is going to migrate. And then we will look at, at the FDA or regulatory agency guidelines that, okay, this is the amount we eventually want, right? Once it reaches to that amount, then its life is over because then regulatory agency will say that, hey, you know, uh, it, is, it is crossing the limit, right? So your shelf life would be based on that migrating substance, not the shelf spoilage of that food. It's a chemical spoilage of that food, right? So re in that case, these curves can guide you in terms of the shelf life based on the chemical migration. If it is quickly migrating and the, 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 it has a low uh, partitioning coefficient, then you will see that within this time, it has probably reached to the limit and that, that, that will be your shelf life. And if you have this or if you can extend this to very you know, longer time, then of course that can give you longer shelf life. Right? But in case of um, active migration, this information is also useful because when you want to have the migration of antimicrobial compound or antioxidant, then this calls can guide you that at what rate you want this compound to migrate. So for example, when you have antimicrobial compound, if you have all the compound came very quickly, it will be, you know, will have its activity, but then microbes can keep growing after that activity. Right? So let's say you have certain amount of antimicrobials, it quickly migrates, but it will have shelf life, right? So after two days, then no more migration, and now these antimicrobials are not helpful. And then bacteria can grow after those two days. But then if the migration is very slow, then it will have effectiveness for a longer period of time. So depending upon the expected shelf life, you want to control the migration. Right? So then this knowledge of diffusivity and partitioning coefficient for a given compound in, in given polymeric film can help you, you know, to, to, to selection and designing of the film for a particular food product. So this is the example how you would have the migration of those compounds. So let's say in this case, this is the film, the shaded area, and this is the, your food. So as you see, these compounds are part of the polymeric structure and these are migrating. But then you can have one more layer, you know, which does not have these kind of a compound. Then this compound has to cross through that film. And then based on the diffusivity of this compound in this film, you can actually control. If it is harmful, then you can have another film which does not allow the diffusion of this compound. So this way you can minimize the migration. But in case of, let's say, antimicrobials or something else where you do want some migration, but you want a slow migration, then you can provide one more barrier and you can tailor-made that barrier and then you can control the migration of this migrating substance. But then you could have the other scenario where these compounds are incorporated in the inner line. That is, again, good example for active packaging. Then you just allow it to migrate from this inner layer or sometimes you can immobilize you know, those active compounds on the surface, so you don't want any migration but to have activity from the surface. So the people or scientists who are working in this area, they are coming many different ways 
to, to provide control release or immobilization of these active compounds on the surface or inside the polymeric structure. So migration does happen in many materials, not necessarily only polymeric materials. And you know, this migration is happening large number of, due to large number of additive, it affects the, the property of the film and the environmental condition and the condition of the food or chemistry of the food. Uh, this is example for microwave susceptor. You know what is microwave susceptor? There also there is a migration. You know what is a microwave susceptor? And get heated. Well, why that, that would be, what would be the application for that? You're right, but what, what, in which situation we want this metal to be get heated in a microwave? So if, you know, when we do cooking, there's a different form of cooking. Like you have baking, you have a grilling, you have roasting, right, you have boiling. So what kind of action happens in, in microwave? It's kind of a boiling, you're just increasing temperature. Can you do roasting in a microwave? Or can you have a crispy texture? Can you get crispiness in microwave? Normally, no. You know, it has a water, or even it has an oil, it will just increase the temperature. In order for crispiness to happen, what we need? Very high temperature at the surface, right? So in order to have that crispiness, for example, if you want to, you know, have a sandwich made other than the toaster, you know, you want to have it in our, you know, fries, you want to have in a microwave. Right? Or you want to have this kind of sandwich, you want to warm it up, but you don't want a sogginess, you want a crispy. Right? So they, you, they can, you can wrap through those metallic film or susceptor. If it is a thick film, it will block the microwave. But it's thin film, it will conduct, it will get heated, and then once it gets heated, it's very high temperature, it's a metal, then it, and if any food coming in a direct contact with this heated surface, then you would have the crispy texture. So, you know, people have done a lot of development in packaging to get the crispy texture in sort of bread or chicken, you know, like you do KFC fried chicken. So they wrap it, you know, rather than deep oil frying, you wrap in those films and then throw in a microwave and then it can give you that sort of uh, crispy texture. But that metal is not just pure metal. There is a, some coating there and of course, you know, the drawback is that that can migrate. So there again, there's a migration issue. And in, in US, there is a company named Keller and Heckman. Uh, it's a private company and expert in, in this migration. So what peop most people do, whenever you develop a food contact materials, before you go to FDA to have your approval, you usually go to this company and say, hey, we had developed this and these are the condition of use. Can you tell us is there any migration? And whatever migration is there, uh, or if there's no migration, they will give you the certificate. With the certificate, you go to FDA and then they give you the approval. Okay, I'm not sure whether there is a similar effort here in India, but uh, that, that's how it, it works there. So this is the example for flavor scalping or absorption. It happens at the surface and then that absorbed compound would diffuse within the film um, through the thickness and you could have loss of vitamin, taste, flavor, color, etc. and it can reduce your shelf life of your product. At the same time, it can also influence the mechanical barrier or other um, properties of your film or it can decrease the seal strength, or it can, uh, you know, you can have a loss of adhesion in laminated structure. The films can delaminate if it absorbs oil or certain flavors. So you want to minimize that from both, you know, damage to the packaging as well as loss of quality of your food products. So there again, a lot of um, uh, research has been done to minimize this scalping of, of your flavors. For example, they use electron beam and do grafting on the surface. So they change the surface 
and that minimize the scalping of um, volatile or flavor. And in terms of the tasting, um, we have a lot of experimental methods developed, a um, lot of um, predictive modeling. You can use certain equations, some of them I showed before. Um, when you do the experiment, so rather than doing the migration testing with each and every food product, which you have millions of different food products, which is not possible to do experiment, then what normally regulatory agencies suggest that you use either distilled water, 3% uh, acetic acid, or 8 to 50% ethanol, or use you know, corn oil or olive oil or mixture of this oil to simulate food, right? Simulate food means it will behave like a food in terms of the migration. So if you have a fatty food, probably you, you want to just taste with the oil. So whatever migration you would see in an oil, it is going to simulate what could happen with the fatty foods. If it is the aqueous food, a lot of water, uh, you know, water rich food, then just work with the distilled water. So, you know, FD has suggested four different food simulant to simulate your food product. So once you have data with these, it means you have data for all food products. And of course, when you want to quantify your migrant uh, permeant in, in, in food, if the food is full of fat, protein, carbohydrates, to extract that compound would be very complicated. So to simplify, then you use kind of a pure, pure compounds, you know, like olive oils or distilled water or acetic acid and so on. And the analytical techniques such as FTIR, GCMS, LCMS and so on, I'm sure some of these techniques you must have used or experienced in your lab. So these are being used to quantify those chemical compounds. And these compounds are in the order of um, ppm, you know, parts per million are sometimes parts per trillion. So can you imagine this very, very small migration, but uh, regulatory agencies are interested whatever migration happening so that you can quantify that. And in terms of the migration, also sometimes we see overall migration, all number of chemical compounds we put together and how much overall migration and sometimes agencies are interested migration of a specific compound. So sometimes the limits are based on one individual compound. So this is the one which I'm showing you that we did some study of migration because in the literature there was a migration of chemical compounds but in the literature there was a no method available to study the migration of nanomaterials. So we were working with a couple of companies. You remember I gave you example of nanocomposites. So these nanocomposites, um, they tend to increase the barrier property um, and sometimes rather than putting nano materials embedding within the polymeric structure, we just do the coating because embedding in is difficult. As I said, you know, you could have aggregation or you could have orientation uh, which can, you know, um, reduce the, um, or I should say increase the diffusion rather than it will not reduce the diffusivity as much as if they were uh, horizontal. So companies were thinking and we were also thinking rather than having composite, we can have a coating just on the surface. That also showed that a lot of improvement in the barrier property. But when with these films, when we approached the food company saying that yes, they, it can improve the you know, shelf life of your product because it has now very, very low permeability with respect to oxygen. The first question comes in the mind of the food company, well, whether these nano particles would migrate into the food because if they, then they have a problem. The consumer is not going to accept. So in order to study, because this coatings uh, is mostly metal oxide coatings and sometimes the particle also, the metal oxide particles. So we said, okay, fine, let's develop a method where which we can monitor the migration of this metal oxide or this nano material. So we develop this cell and there you make a small pouch of the film which you, has been improved as a nano composite or nano coating. And then in that um, pouch, you put your food simulant and put it into this um, cell. And outside you can put water in this cell and seal it, like it's showing here. And in case of a microwave, we have a smaller microwave unit. Uh, it's a company called CEM. It's, it's known as a SPD or uh, Discover. In there, you can also load your pouch with the food simulant put it into this and it, you can simulate the time temperature profile 
very similar to what you would have a big uh, microwave unit. And then you do the experiment and see whether uh, conventional heating and microwave heating, how much it influences on the migration of your nanomaterials. So as you can see here, um, the process time, the red one showing the conventional heating. As you know, the conventional heating uh, thermal processing takes longer time. So this is, the, this is the profile for that to give you some level of lethality. But in case of a micro heating, it is very fast. So the short period of time, you can achieve the same lethality in your product. So we, we subjected those films to this kind of a temperature profile. And then we quantified the migration of silicon particles. So that's where being used in, in, in those films to improve the barrier property. And it showed the level of migration of silicon in different films. One is, let's say, a nylon-based film. One is a PET-based film. We saw that the migration around 5 to 12 ppm, so so many milligrams per kilogram of your food product. And in case of a microwave and retard, in both cases, we saw significant migration. And in this case, uh, so then when these films were used as a multi-layer films or the composite films, rather than the just coating, then, then you see in case of a composite, you see lower amount of migration compared to the coated film. So this is a coated film, the other two are also coated films. You see coated film, coated film. So if you have nanoparticles on a coating and the food is coming in direct contact with the coating, you have more migration. But if you have composite film where nanoparticles are embedded into the po polymeric material, they had to really diffuse within the polymeric material, come to the surface and then get into the food. So in that case, you can reduce the level of migration. This you see in this case of only 1.2 or 1 ppm. Then rather than using the coated film alone, if you sandwich between other two film like cast polypropylene and oriented nylon film. So now you are not having a food in a direct contact with the coated film. This coated film also you sandwich between two other films. In that case also it can reduce the migration significantly as you can see here um, rather than 12, 14 it is coming in the range of 1 ppm and here also you see Everything is around 1 to 1.2 ppm. So multi-layer structure forming can also reduce the level of migration. The other information from this slide you can take it is the effect of temperature. So if you have low temperature, medium temperature and high temperature, then you say higher the temperature, higher the level of migration. This is the film type A which is based on the coated PET then film B is coated nylon. So in both cases, the, the effect was similar. And this is the, showing the effect of time. So as you can see that at 70 degrees C, if you go from this time to this time, 18 minutes to 35 minutes, you see in, increase in the migration. But actually, at high temperature, statistically, there is no difference the lower processing time at high process time. So from this, this study, we learned that the temperature is actually threshold, not really time. So as, as soon as the, the film is reaching to certain temperature, whether you process for a shorter period of time or longer period of time, you would see some level of migration. So even though we see in all this and the previous slides, some level of migration is around one, especially the film which was protected from the other two film, you see in the range of one to 1.2, and the FDA limit for this metal migration is actually 9 ppm. So even though there, there is a, some level of migration of metals, it is way, way below whatever the limit set by the regulatory agency. Once you establish this, then these companies were allowed to use this film for the processing of food or packaging of food. This is just, just the showing the um, FTIR results that, that the FTIR is showing the absorption spectra of different bonds um, here at this wavelength and the other wavelength which is corresponding to silicon oxygen, silicon and silicon oxygen 
bond and this intensity is changing it means these, these uh, silicon which are bounded with the oxygen in the polymeric matrix they were releasing and they were migrating. So this was just to explain the mechanism or the reason for migration that these bonds are really affected as a result of thermal processing the intensity is decreasing and this allowing this silicon to migrate detach from the film uh, coating and then migrate into the food material. So this is what I have in terms of the polymeric film permeation and migration. If you have any question uh, so far, I'll be happy to answer, then we move to the other lecture. I have uh, two questions. Sure. One regarding the addition of that uh, nanoclay. Mm -hmm. If you add the nanoclay into the solution, then whether it, it will affect uh, the tensile properties of the film or not? Uh, I, I want remarks on this as well as uh, um, there is one in case of uh, intentional addition when we add the antimicrobials uh, maybe uh, that will be a volatile compound uh, in the process of uh, solution that means uh, prepare preparation of the film and uh, obviously we are reaching towards the uh, gelatinization temperature so uh, when we reach towards the gelatinization temperature so is there any uh, possibility of instant volatility of uh, that compound at that point and how can we undermine the instant volatility at that point? Okay, let's take one at a time. So first is whether nano composite or nano platelets or nano particles would affect the tensile property. Yes, they do. So depending upon the type of nanoparticle and depending upon the polymeric film in which you are embedding, whether it's a polypropylene or polyethylene or nylon or EVOH, Yes, it does change it. For food processing perspective, our always the goal was to improve the barrier property. But other non-food applications, many places, they are in fact using nanoparticles or nanoplatelets to modify the mechanical strength of those films. That means whatever the strength we are getting is suf sufficient for the food food uh, packaging. So, in case of a, a Food packaging probably objective was not really to modify mechanical property, but then inherently it does modify a little bit, but it's in a positive direction. If you include lot of nanoparticles, then it can make the brittle film also. You know, we, we need certain level of flexibility. But mechanical strength is definitely improved, like a tensile strength. Okay, even though maybe we don't need to improve because whatever it is their original polymer, it is sufficient but it tends to modify. So as I said, in our case, our objective was to Im improve the barrier property, which we were able to, but it was affecting mechanical property, we ignored because we were not interested in. But as I said, from other groups whose interest was to modify mechanical property, so they were looking more that aspect, and it is very well documented in the literature that nanoparticles can also improve the mechanical strength of the film. Okay, your other question about the antimicrobial, so you're talking about the synthetic films or you're talking about the biopolymer based films? Biopolymer. Yeah, so biopolymer based films such as the, let's say starch based film, right? So you, you are bringing the point of gelatinization, right? So, so what, what is your really question that you want to avoid the gelatinization or? No sir, when we add the uh, intentional micro, when, when we you know, try to have an intentional migra migrants into the solution, uh, that is poly polymer solution, then uh, when we add it and when we uh, heat that material uh, for the gelatin, up to the gelatinization temperature, then there may be a chance of instant volatility of that compound at that, at that point only. So we can. That means it will uh, have a chance to reduce the proportion of that vo volatile compounds uh, in the polymers. Later, later words. That's correct. So this is one of the biggest challenge in the commercialization or manufacturing of bio-based polymeric films embedded with antimicrobials, because most of the industrial application, I'm sure some of you would have been working in the lab, we do solution casting. So you prepare the solution, you add antimicrobials or antioxidant into it, 
and put in a petri dish, allow its solvent to evaporate and you have the film. But this is a lab scale method. Industrially, you would do extrusion process and extrusion process is the high temperature process. And most of these antimicrobials and antioxidants are actually temperature sensitive. So when you do that, you actually lose most of its activity and sometimes all the activity you can lose. So that's why so far we have not been very, very successful in developing edible films which are active or incorporated antimicrobials. So to overcome this, what some are doing, rather than having the composite, they're doing the coatings. So you first stretch the film, you know, if it is a bio-based, let's say carbohydrate or starch-based, you do gelatinization, whatever, but it, in the solution you don't have antimicrobial yet. So you stretch the film, then you have this, your antimicrobial, put in some solvent, and then spread that solvent over that film. You can do spraying, and then allow the solvent to evaporate, and then you know, this antimicrobial could stick on that surface. And then you can incorporate some other material which will allow it to adhere that antimicrobial on the surface of the film. So this is how um, industry is currently using. It's more like a coating rather than embedding into the into the polymeric structure. But this is a very good point. In fact, other people are also working to encapsulate first this antimicrobial so that you have more temperature resistant and then incorporate. It works, but the problem was that if encapsulation is very strong, then the release of antimicrobials, because you want it to release also, right? Then that becomes a challenge. So yeah, people have been doing a lot of research around that. Um, disadvantage, no, this is being incorporated to have some advantage. The disadvantage is that if they tend to migrate, then we have a problem. So you want to minimize that migration. And also, if you increase the large quantity, then it, you, it can reduce its flexibility. It, the film becomes a little bit brittle. And then, you know, you, in most cases, you want a very high flexibility in the film. So that could be disadvantage, but then you optimize the level of nanoparticles so that you do not changing the flexibility of the film. You are improving the mechanical property, you are improving the barrier property, but you are minimizing the change in the flexibility. Correct. So people, people have developed a lot of films, synthetic films, as well as the bio-based film incorporated with the silver nanoparticle. You're right, it has a very good antimicrobial activities, but they need to do commercial trial in terms of the cost of manufacturing, if there is any issue, and then do the shelf life studies, really how much it's really able to extend the shelf life. Altogether, it will decide the commercial success or viability of that film. But, but it has showed good promise, at least in the lab studies, yeah. Is there any thumb rule for bulk storage of fresh produce? Is there any? Thumb rule. Well, thumb, yeah, thumb rule is that, you know, USD has done, actually you can go to USDA database. Yeah, it's, it's, it's open to the public. And, uh, Scientists in US and I'm sure all over the world have done a lot of research in terms of the optimal gas composition for different food product, uh, different fresh produce, uh, fruits and vegetable. So you can get guidance from that database uh, to design the bulk storage. So temperature is very straightforward. You know, the thing is that the, whatever the bulk storage structures we are presently using for in Indian conditions, for cereals and pulses and all seeds, oh. we are mostly preferring uh, one thumb rule. That is the temperature in degree Fahrenheit and humidity in per percentage. The summation should be less than 100. But in fruits, uh, fruits and vegetables, we are just talking about now oxygen and carbon dioxide concentration during the storage. But how you can directly control the respiration rate of produce so that in, uh, as far as condition in Indian bulk storage conditions, they are usually targeting only temperature and humidity. 
not any gases because again it is cost leading and cost effective then problem correct so so you're talking about the pulses or are you talking about fresh produce no actually sir pulses cereals pulses and ulcers it is already over sir but in fresh produce presently using in uh, just now a uh, few months back government of india started cool, cooling chain rail chain for uh, horticulture crops but again we issue is with cost effective how you can reduce the cost by controlling the only temperature and humidity so that it will reduce the respiration rate so that we can neglect the whatever the cost required for to optimize the gases concentration so you are right any 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 major you take it will involve cost right so if you want to reduce the temperature you have re refrigeration you want to control the relative humidity and because the transpiration will keep happening is going to keep on building up the relative humidity higher and higher inside your chamber and if you it's very close to 100% then a small temperature fluctuation is going to cause condensation which is not desirable and then third is the gas composition every step would involve cost so then somebody has to sit down and do the cost analysis that if you don't take any major what is the shelf life and how much product you are losing right and what is your loss and what is your return and then now you say look i'm going to take one at a time so if i do just refrigeration let's say what is the capital cost and this only refrigeration how much life is going to extend and whether it is worth and then you add another factor from humidity and then the third factor from you know gas composition so this is purely economic question Uh, scientifically all these factor would help but then at some place somebody has to sit down and do the cost analysis to see how much of the benefit as against to the investment because presently for resins and other vegetables dried vegetables they are charging higher mostly farmers are using custom based cold bases uh, cold storages in that they are just controlling temperature and humidity but they are charging the charges per ton or per unit volume of that produce based on this their conditions either temperature or humidity if it is temperature humidity can uh, range is high then cost is low but they are going for low humidity low temperature then i guess cost is per unit volume or per unit that sample it is very high sir because if they are investing they want their return of their investment right so the cost will become higher definitely but then it will allow availability of the material otherwise if they don't do it then that material is spoiled and it's not available in the market right so if they are investing it then they would like to have the return on their investment so it it, it is like that um, and i i don't think there's any other answer for that once you make some investment you, the product is going to be expensive basically the question is regarding only how to adjust oxygen and uh, carbon dioxide concentration well without, I, without any Uh, controlled atmosphere facilities only temperature and humidity sir temperature humidity and initial moisture content of that product is it possible sir see temperature so humidity will just control the the humidity that's the, but the respiration in terms of the co2 and o2 does depend upon the temperature so you can reduce the temperature and see for most fruits and vegetable that information is also available so if you reduce the temperature the the co2 production and the oxygen consumption is also reduced right if it is reduced then in the bulk storage it is going to produce some level of ox, um, you know maintain some level of uh, oxygen as well as co2 but if you do not mechanically control then it's going to go beyond whatever is the optimal there so let's say even though it produces a small amount of co2 with lower temperature but then if you do not change you know mechanically control in that control storage this going to keep on building up right and in case if if you do not control the oxygen it just it's a air tight room then it's going to keep on consuming the oxygen right and then you will have anaerobic condition but then if you simply open the room to atmospheric condition then of course there is no balance for the oxygen and co2 then co2 level will be nearly zero because it is open to outside atmosphere and oxygen level will be 21% so it's 
So then you don't have any. So it's, it's, it's not straightforward that without any investment or any mechanical you know, equipment, you will be able to control. Yeah. See, in case of modified atmosphere packaging, the barrier film can allow you to some control based on the permeability of the film. But in, in a bulk storage, unless you sort of a, have a, a smaller holes in the room, you design in a manner that they allow a certain level of you know, gas exchange, you know, let's say bulk room like this, you know, initially assume the air tight, all doors are closed, windows are cold, closed, but then you have some openings and some filters you know, and then do calculation for bulk storage, like you have tons and tons of produce, how much oxygen they are going to consume, how much uh, uh, CO2 they are going to produce. Based on that, if you uh, allow some opening, it might help a little bit to maintain um, the gas composition inside. But temperature alone would not.